so today I'm going to be uh, talking about yuccas again. I'm kind of on a bit of a yucca kick. Um, so last week I was showing you the observation of the Great Plains yucca that I took in Iowa. And I was talking about how I was pretty surprised um, to find out that we have a native yucca here in Massachusetts. Um, and from, but from the observations on INAT, uh, it looked like a lot of them were cultivated. Um, it's a decently popular ornamental plant. Um, but this past week, I was in uh, Truro camping with my roommates, and I came across a blooming common yucca in Massachusetts. So um, after I saw that, I thought it was fate I had to talk a little more about the yucca, especially the common yucca that we have here. Um, so you can see it has this kind of like, like really striking spike of white flowers um, and the classic kind of like succulent growth scheme of the actual leaves at the bottom of the plant you can see there. There's a little more of the flowers. And the flowers kind of slowly open up going up the, up the spike. So you can see that the further out and the higher up flowers aren't open yet. They kind of start opening closer to the actual stock. So yeah, I'm actually going to kind of bring uh, two things together uh, that I've talked about the past two weeks. Uh, you might remember a couple weeks ago, I talked about Joshua trees, um, which are also yuccas, obviously. Um, and I briefly mentioned the yucca moth and its symbiosis with Joshua trees. Um, and it also has a symbiosis with the common yucca. It's a pretty, it's kind of a yucca generalist, if you can call something that specializes that narrowly in a type of plant, a generalist. Um, and last week I talked about the lengths to which butterflies go to find the plants that they associate with and kind of cultivate that relationship that they have these plants, their larval, ho with these, with their larval hosts. Um, so monarchs with milkweed travel thousands of miles every year to make use of this resource. Um, and yucca moths uh, are much, much smaller than monarchs. Don't make the, quite the same journey, uh, but they make a similarly strong commitment to their relationship with this plant. Um, so as you can see, yucca flowers are, um, they're, kind of striking, but they're not the showiest flowers in the world. They're not an obvious um, nectar pollinator attractor flower. Um, they don't have the, those colors, that kind of like striking color closer to the center of the flower where you would find the nectar. And we do know that yucca are seldom, if at all, um, visited, visited by our common pollinators. Um, and that's because yuccas are pretty much exclusively pollinated by yucca moths. Um, and it's, it's a, a close enough relationship that it verges on, some observers have said it almost seems like they're farming the plants with how deliberately they pollinate them. Um, so the yucca moth, oops, that's the wrong order. The yucca moth has really developed palps um, I'm not sure if it's the maxillary or labial here, um, but much more developed than most moths. Um, and they use those palps to kind of gather a ball of pollen whenever they visit a yucca flower. Um, and they actually, once they've gathered that ball of pollen, kind of like a bee with its, the sacs on its legs, it kind of stuffs the pollen in between its head and thorax. It has like a little pollen ball under its head as it's flying from flower to flower. And when they visit another flower, they'll take pollen from that ball and put it directly into the stigma of the flower, the female part of the flower, using those palps again to kind of pull the, pull the pollen out of the pollen ball. Um, and then they'll lay their eggs at the base of the flower, um, kind of almost directly in the ovary of the flower. And um, they, they really cooperate with these plants really well. Uh, yucca moths usually avoid laying too many eggs on a single flower, not because the caterpillars would be less successful, but because the flower will often abort those flowers. Um, it'll stress out the plant and it'll abort those flowers. So the yucca moth leaves pheromones behind once it's laid eggs to let other yucca moths know 
this flower has enough eggs in it, move along to the next one. And of course, as you saw with the stalk here, the flower stalk, the flowers are usually plentiful. Um, so, yeah, so after the eggs are laid in the flower, um, the moth will kind of mature inside the, the seed pod once the flower matures itself. Um, and they'll kind of eat away in one section of the seed pod. You can kind of see at the top here how it splits into these kind of six sections there. Um, and they'll kind of feed up, they'll feed on the seeds in one particular section. And if they run out of food in one section, they will um, bore through to the next one, but they usually stay, stay inside one of those sections. Um, and it's really evident on, on these seed pods when there is a significant caterpillar presence. You can see, as this caption says here, um, there's a little bit of constriction around the center of the seed pod where the seeds were most heavily consumed. So that's an often a pretty obvious sign. And you can also see that there's an exit hole from the larva. So you know that a mature caterpillar left this pod. Um, and after they leave the pod, they will uh, climb down the plant or uh, kind of uh, rappel down the plant with some silk, um, crawl a little ways, and pupate underground. They, like a lot of insects that pupate underground, can pupate for a few years. Um, they always overwinter as a pupa, but sometimes if conditions aren't right, they will avoid uh, eclosing for a couple years until, until the conditions tell them to surface and eclose. And so I just got a few videos to play. So you can kind of see the moth at home and the flower here. Um, and you can see it kind of crawling around there, might be collecting some pollen, and then it kind of climbs up the female part of the flower and then slowly retreats down until its abdomen is closer to the base of the flower and it can lay the eggs there. Um, and so I was talking, when I was talking about Joshua trees and other yuccas in the West as well, um, they're really central parts of their ecosystems. Um, they, they support a lot of bird species that nest in them, a lot of mammals um, and other birds feed on either insects that are feeding on the seed pods or the seed pods themselves. Um, rodents and things will nest um, at their bases and the roots. Um, and that's actually not really true in the east here. Um, vertebrates don't really make much use of, of the common yucca in the east. Um, in general, vertebrates are a little more adapted to the kind of um, softer, more pliable leaves of much, many of the plants we have around here um, and can't make as good use of the kind of habitat that the stiff succulent leaves of the yucca give. Um, there are a few other insects besides the yucca moth. Um, there's a moth called the bogus yucca moth, um, which looks very similar. It's a little smaller and it's, it's a stem borer. Um, so that one is parasitic. It's not a mutualistic relationship like the actual yucca moth is. Um, and there are a few other stem boring moths that make use of this as well as scale insects, some of, some of the true bug hemipteran um, kind of sucker bugs you'll see on some yuccas, but really no vertebrate presence at all. Um, but while the yucca isn't a keystone of the ecosystem we have around here, it is a keystone of the lifestyle and the entire life of these moths. Um, they're very at home on the plants in many different ways. Um, usually if you see a moth doing any sort of reproductive behavior or foraging behavior, um, like they are at these plants, they're a little flighty. It's hard to sneak up on them or approach them. Um, and it's actually hard to get a yucca moth to leave a yucca flower. Um, field scientists have to kind of vigorously shake the flower to get the yucca moths to come out. Uh, if you disturb it at all, they won't fly away. They'll usually just retreat further into the flower. Um, so yeah, even though it's not a really central part of our ecosystem, it's a, it's a home for these moths and it's where they live almost their entire lives. Um, so that's that, the close and storied relationship of the yucca moths and their yuccas.
And I actually just wanted to share some reading here too. Um, there's a cool article here um, from, I think this is the, yeah, a uh, blog run by the Nature Conservancy about yuccas and yucca moths. Um, and then I just also wanted to recommend, I don't know if people have seen uh, these books by John Eastman. Um, they're cool field guides. Um, they're not really visual field guides. They're much more uh, like full of ecological information. Um, this is Field and Roadside, which had an entry for the yucca. And they have... Um, Every, every plant species in here has a section about associates. Um, so there'll be really cool specific information about insects, birds, um, and stuff like that. And I've been slowly filling out my collection of these. There are a few different, um, it's field, there's a marsh one, there's uh, obviously a forest thicket one. Um, and he has this a similar one that, uh, a similar set of field guides he's written for birds as well. Um, so that was just a cool field guide, um, that I decided to kind of dig back out and check out, um, and found some pretty cool information in there. So just wanted to recommend that people hadn't heard of John Eastman.